going on podcast listeners i hope you guys are excited about this episode my dear friend alec weck is joining me again this time we decided to go super old school and talk about the 1950s noir film the asphalt jungle starring starling sterling hayden and sam jaffe i think i pronounced that correctly i don't know maybe not but before we get into that don't miss your chance to win super cool pop culture and movie related stuff in our current winter giveaway all you have to do to enter to win is to like, comment, and share three different social media posts of ours, that's Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, before March 1st. The winner will be picked at random live on our YouTube channel, March 27th. Terms and conditions apply, no purchase necessary, void where prohibitive. But enough of that, on with the show. Hey, man. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm excited to be here. Thanks I, for having me. No problem. No problem. I'm excited to have you. This is, uh, this is a pretty classic movie we went with. Yeah, you know, it is, but it's ironically something that we both hadn't seen. And I like to pride myself on the type of guy that is very versed in black and white films. I like these slow kind of dramas and movies like this. And... Uh, we hadn't seen this one, had we? No, see, so I, I'm with you. Humphrey Humphrey Bogart's one of my favorite actors. He's not in this film, but it plays into the whole um, black and white type stuff. Uh, I love Maltese Falcon. I, I love, um, I mean, even Chinatown is relatively old with Jack Nicholson. Um, and we went with what is arguably considered a classic, uh, the 1950s film, uh, the the Asphalt Jungle. Um, and you want you want to talk a little bit about how we came up with this film? Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, you and I, we go back quite a ways now in our lives. And uh, we, we do shower each other like two, like two heterosexual lovers um, with gifts once in a while. And you got me a book, 501 Musty Movies, which is on the bookshelf. It is it is beaten up from flipping through it so many times. And, uh, you know, we were discussing, hey, what are we going to do next next podcast? Let's open up the book. Let's pick out a few movies, a uh, few genres, and uh, we we, fe- we settled on this one, right? Yeah, we settled on Asphalt Jungle. Now, this is um, nowadays largely marketed as a Marilyn Monroe movie. I had never seen her as an actress before, had you? I've only seen her in one other movie, uh, and, I, and I don't even recall the name of it. But uh, And this was – it's marketed as that now, but it wasn't then, right? Correct. Yeah. So here's the thing. Uh, Marilyn Monroe, at the time this film is shot, is a relatively unknown actress. She is in the film for, I think her total screen time is probably like three and a half minutes, four, maybe four minutes. Um, she's in two scenes. She's got a couple lines and it wasn't even the uh, first pick for the role. Um, but then obviously as her career progresses and she becomes the icon that she is today and MGM is looking to kind of repackage these sort of films uh, and get to newer audiences, she's put right on the cover and uh, her name is moved above the title. But this is not a Marilyn Monroe film at all. No, but, you know, she does really well, you know, especially for a young actress. You can see the beginnings of what she becomes in this movie. And I think that, you know, for me, and I'm not a Marilyn Monroe fan, right? But she is just so stunning for this time period. She has this kind of bubbly personality. Uh, you know, one of the characters is her sugar daddy before there were sugar daddies, right? <laughs> and <laughs> She calls him that. She calls him daddy or sugar daddy or no, something. No, uh, wasn't it uncle? I think uncle. Called, uncle. Yeah, that's what it was. Even weirder. <laughs> Even weirder. Um, one of the things that I found interesting about about this movie and about other movies from this time period this is before the big budget picture this is before you have movies that are costing you know millions of dollars to make and grossing millions of dollars in fact i mean this movie is a complete failure it it, the budget is estimated at about 1.2 million 
which is enormous for the time. And it grosses $30,000, which is just unbelievable. Uh, it's a huge failure. It comes out uh, June 1st, 1950. Um, but what I was going to say was movies during this time period, they don't have explosions. They don't have in-depth storylines. They don't have um, you know, big scenes and CGI and, and actors aren't getting paid a ton of money. You don't have stunt doubles, et cetera, et cetera. Movies of this time period are largely dialogue and largely drama script based movies. You have to capture the audience by giving them a really good, interesting story, which is part of the reason why I love these kind of movies, because when you can get a movie like Citizen Kane or Maltese Falcon or Casablanca that has such an intriguing storyline, you don't need all the extras. And I think that's something that Hollywood has not only drifted away from, but completely forgot uh, as of recent with the with the Marvel big budget blockbusters. Yeah, and even before that, you have the Michael Bay era of, you know, huge movies with obscene explosions. But I'm totally with you. That's what I love about all of these movies from this era. It's just a slow burn. It is just a buildup of character development and plot. And then you kind of have a conclusion. And I think that it's... That's what I like about these movies best. But just to hit back on your point, you know, you said it was $1.2 million in 1950. When you adjust that for inflation, that's just under $13 million in today's money, which is less than, you know, an actor makes – an actors get paid more in a film than they – yeah, uh, this, this did totally. So it's it's, it's insane. It's insane. Um, so keeping with season two, uh, I want to show a couple things have changed since the last time you've been on the show. Uh, number one, uh, thank you for joining us here at Gutsy Media Podcast because movies are our lives. Um, that is the new tagline for the show. Coming with the new tagline, there's also a new purpose. Why are we doing this? Why are we sitting down and talking about these movies, these movies that we either love or have never seen or find interesting? Well, the reason is we have to get to the heart of the issue. What we need to decide during the course of our conversation today is, was this a good movie? And with that simple question comes a lot of interesting details. I think that when it comes to finding a good movie, there are different ways of approaching it. And I, I, what we talked about a lot in season one was why critics and audiences tend to view movies differently. A lot of times when you go on some of these websites and you see the critics reviews, um, the audience may have rated it a good movie while the critics tore it apart or vice versa. Maybe the audience hated it and the critics were raving about it. And I think that's because of the different approaches. When you watch a movie from a critic's standpoint, somebody who's looking at the acting or the cinematography, or does the score go well with this scene? You tend to really dive into the details and lose the face value of the movie, the story, the plot. Was it interesting? Um, did I want to fall asleep? I mean, there's plenty of movies that we can talk about that won Oscars in one way or another, but arguably were bad movies or great movies that didn't even get nominated. So, uh, that that's at the heart of this question is was it a good movie um and we're talking any way you want to approach it whether you want to you know dive into the details or or just skim the surface completely up to you so just keep that in mind as we go through this uh we're talking about asphalt jungle the the movie comes out in 1950 it's got some big names in it like i said we talked about marilyn monroe so i'm trying to pull up people that maybe the nowadays audience would know there's an actor by the name of Jack Warden in this movie. Um, he was an actor. He, he passed away in 2006, but you'll probably know him best from movies like While You Were Sleeping, 12 Angry Men. He was in Problem Child uh, as the grandfather. A um, couple other movies, The Replacements. Um, are you familiar with the actor that I'm, I'm talking about? Yeah, you know, he, he's one of those actors, for any of your listeners out there, they don't know him when they see him. They're like, oh, yeah, I know this guy. He's, he's been in other stuff I've seen. So he's one of those classic. And I think that for all the actors we're going to discuss, the majority of them have been in other things. But none of them, this movie's from the 1950s, right? We, no one knows these people by names. I mean, this is just, it, other than Marilyn, who's that iconic actress that we all know and love. 
Right. So what's interesting about Jack um, Warden when you when you do see him, and I highly encourage people to, to just hop online real quick and look him up, because like Alex said, he is one of those actors that you will recognize when you see his face. This is his very first movie role. Uh, he is uncredited in in the credits. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about the Actors Guild. Um, I actually served with somebody whose son was trying to get into the Actors Guild. And uh, things may have changed since then, or maybe I misunderstood him when he explained it to me. But basically, when you want to be an actor in Hollywood, you can get you know background roles and, and things that you're uncredited for. Um, once you get a speaking role, they have to credit you in the film. And once you have three speaking roles, regardless of whether it's a 90 minute monologue or just a quick, you know, can I refill your coffee? Um, once you get three speaking roles, you can then submit to be part of the Actors Guild. And then at that point, you're kind of a, a union member and you can get, uh, you know, different roles and they, they'll kind of help you a little bit more in your career. Um, so this is prior to even that for him. Uh, again, assuming that the the issues or the ways of getting in were the same back then. One of the other big name actors that's in this movie is uh, an actor by the name of James Whitmore. Um, I'm sure you guys will recognize that name. He was in Shawshank Redemption. He plays Brooks, probably one of his biggest roles there. Um, he's been in a ton of other things, Fun with Dick and Jane, um, The Majestic, tons of TV shows, um, and obviously this movie. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Like you, you know, when I'm watching a movie, I can't wait to get on IMDb afterwards to go do a little bit of research on any movie I'm watching. But he's one of the ones that escaped me. I did not. He looks so different as a young guy than oh, sure. Brooks Anlin, who's, you know, from anyone that's seen Shawshank knows Brooks. This old man who's, you know, working in the library, just you, you couldn't even put him together until you realize it. And then you can kind of see some of the similarities. But, yeah, I love Brooks. I love James Whitmore. Great, great actor. He plays a character in this movie called Gus. He is a local bar owner. A um, couple minor parts. He, you know, he's got a couple speaking parts in the, in the movie. The, the, the other thing I like about movies from back then is they don't really spend a whole lot of time going into backstories. You have these characters that you can kind of just assume know each other. Um, the movie starts off and you're following one gentleman who I'm going to get his character name. His, his character name is um, Dix. He is, for all intents and purposes, um, kind of like your shady local robbery guy. He holds up a couple, you know, banks here and there. Um, you know, gambles a little bit. He's just, he's not he's, a great he's, guy. He's the muscle, right? In the in the in the crime world, he's a big old Nebraska corn fed mule. He's, yeah, uh, absolutely. He's, he's gonna do some work. Absolutely. So you're following him. Uh, he's he's being followed by the cops. Or the cops are looking for him, presumably because of something that he pulled over. Again, these types of movies, you don't know why the cops are looking for him. You just understand that it's probably something he recently did. He's also, he goes into the local bar uh, where Gus is working. Um, and Gus knows who he is. So he's known around the neighborhood. And uh, I, I don't know. What do you think about the backstory elements of these type of movies? I, you know, I think it is. I think it's you pick up at a moment in time, and rarely is there anything known about what's occurred previously. It is just the camera is following these people, you know, a day in the life of, and whatever they did in the past is in the past. We're just going to follow them going forward. And this is one of my favorite scenes. This opening scene is fantastic, only because I just like I love criminals that look after one another. I have a thing for that. And right off the bat, Dick's he's being kind of chased by the police. He knows he's about to be arrested. He walks into Gus's diner or restaurant or bar, whatever the hell it is, two stool. You know, there's only two stools in the damn place and immediately gives Gus his gun to hide. Gus knows exactly what's going on, takes that gun, puts it in the register. Two seconds later, a cop walks in. You know, they harass Dix, arrest him. And then uh, they say, hey, we, we want to search your place, Gus. And, you know, Gus, as all criminals know, he immediately says, you got a warrant. You, 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 you know, you know, they know the law. Of course, the police don't have a warrant. Uh, so they don't get dicks on the gun charge and, uh, you know, they're, they're none the wiser. So I, I just love that kind of setup right off the bat. That's, that's where we're at. Yeah, it was, it was pretty cool opening. Um, so, so largely the, the premise is about a very intelligent criminal. Uh, he goes by the name of doc. He served a considerable amount of time. I think he said he was in for seven years or something like that, or, or maybe longer. Um, he gets out and he has this great idea of how he can, 
rob a bunch of money and jewels from this local investor. Um, again, not much detail behind it, but he's got this idea. And if, if he's able to pull it off, it's going to be the largest caper in history. And now, mind you, this is a 1950s movie. He's talking about this is going to be a million dollar caper, which I mean, if, if anybody's ever seen Austin Powers, he might as well have said a bazillion gajillion dollars. <laughs> like, it's just unbelievable amount. So he he doesn't know how to do it. Like, he, he knows how to do it, but he doesn't have the people to do it. So he's looking for somebody who will fund him. Um, I need some upfront money so I can hire the right people. We can pull this off and then, you know, make millions or, or a million. And he comes across a, a bookmaker or bookkeeper, if you will, by the name of Kobe uh, and has him tells him what's going on. Kobe's like, no, no problem. I got the perfect guy that can do this. My boss, um, who goes by the name of Al- Alonzo, he will be able to give you the money. He'll give you the money. He'll, you know, we'll, we'll hire some people and um, we'll, we'll make this happen. So he meets with Alonzo. Alonzo says, yeah, no problem. You know, I got, I got tons of money. I can do that. Um, and, you know, let's go find the right people. Well, in the meantime of finding the right people, you also discover that Alonzo is broke, does not have all that money, which I thought was an interesting twist. I love that right off the bat, just again, another layer of complexity. Now we've got different views, different things happening. We've got to kind of follow it all. So I, I'm, I'm loving this story up until this point. Also, as a little side twist here, Alonzo has a wife who, for whatever reason, is limited to her bed. She seems fully with it. Um, she doesn't seem like she has any intellectual issues, but she's she's in bed. She can't leave the bed. And Alonzo is fooling around on her with Marilyn Monroe, who, for whatever reason, calls him uncle, um, yeah, which know, is this, creepy. It's just a classic kind of tale where I feel like this dude, he was rich. He had a lot of money. But then the habits, the spending habits are just eating him alive. He's got a chick. He's got a side chick. These are the same problems we're going through 70 years later. You know, it's just <laughs> it's just guys being morons, you know. Absolutely. Um, so they managed to get a, a crew of guys together. Uh, I'm trying to think. I think there's five guys in total. You have Doc. You have the big Kentucky um, you know, muscle. You have the getaway driver. And uh, I think maybe there's one other guy in in the the safe cracker that has to actually crack the safe. That's um, right. That's right. So back by Alonzo and and the bookie, uh, Kobe, they go in and they rob this place. And for all intent and purposes, it's it's successful. Um, they do have a little bit of an issue with the explosion to open the safe. It sets off a, a bank alarm across the street, which draws the police in, and they have to. Um, get they have to get rid of a security guard that that busts in, whose gun accidentally goes off and shoots one of them in the stomach. Uh, this is the safe cracker. Um, to to bring to bring that story arc to a quick close, he eventually dies. Um, and and there's one guy out of the way. Uh, they get away. They go back to Alonzo's. Now at this point, um, the getaway driver is is basically not important for the rest of the movie because it, it winds up being just doc and, and Kentucky boy who go to Alonzo's and, and they have an, a prearranged uh, setup where we're going to give you the jewels. You're going to give us the money and then you'll go and sell the jewels for more than what you've paid us. And that'll be your cut. Well, Alonzo has worked it out with some lawyer friend of his that he is going to tell the guys that he does not have the money and that if they'll just leave the jewels with him, he will turn around and sell them. And for whatever reason, he thinks this is a good idea. Like, yeah, the, the two other crooks will be more than happy to leave you the jewels with the nothing 1950s, in return. The, the 1950s were a trusting time when just honor <laughs> among thieves and here you take the million dollars worth of diamonds and I'll come back tomorrow for the money. Well, the, the thing that Doc brings up, or I, I think Alonzo brings up to Doc, is you're fresh out of prison. Something like this happens, they're immediately going to look to you. And you don't want to have the jewels on you. So just give them to me. I'm going to sell them tonight. And then you'll come back tomorrow and get your money. And he's already kind of prearranged that tomorrow he won't have the money either. And then he'll just leave the country and live happily ever after with the jewels. Well, Doc's not really feeling this. 
Um, a Kentucky boy is not really feeling this. And the lawyer who is involved because why not uh, gets a little trigger happy and he pulls out a gun and he says, basically, you know, you're going to walk away. And Kentucky boy and the lawyer had this kind of Mexican standoff. Guns go off. The lawyer dies, but Kentucky takes a rib shot. So he's he's bleeding pretty good. Now, he's also got a woman that he's fooling around with um, who who's. Uh, go ahead. What, what do you want to say? This is just the relationship between Dix, the cornbread mule and his girl. Just one of the oddest relationships in all of cinema. She clearly wants him. Clearly. He is either stupid or. Or oblivious, or some, or not interested, but he could, he could care. Like, you you yeah. staying over? Like, oh, you staying over tonight? That's not really. I'm not too happy with that. Like, yeah, I got the impression that he did not, he didn't care about her. He didn't, he didn't want to be with her. I don't think he was oblivious to it. I just think he was like, yeah, I don't, I'm not interested in you. But in certain circumstances, it served him, served his purpose. So he kind of kept her around. The other thing I love about this, uh, purely 1950s, her character name is Doll. Oh, I, I know. I agree. I love it. I love it. Doll. So we got it, Doll and Dicks. My, there are right. This is a this is an era period, right? So there's certain things that a censorship wouldn't allow. I also love a good 1950s sm- uh, kiss when they smooch. It's just it's just their lips pressing again. There's there's no passion. It's just we're just gonna hold our mouths together for a minute. <laughs> it's like this awkward. Um, listen, listeners out there, try to do that to your significant other one. Go kiss them, but just hold it there for about five <laughs> seconds. See how that goes for you. It was That'll worth great. The 50s. Yeah, please write us and let us know how it turns out. <laughs> um, so they go back to Doll's place, and uh, she patches Kentucky Boy up, but she's not very good at it. She doesn't really know what she's doing. And and they basically, Kentucky and Doc agree to part ways. Um, at, at this point, for whatever reason, Doc's not even interested in the money. He's like, just take the jewels and go your way. I'm going to head back to to my family farm in Kentucky. And, and, Dahl convinces him to take her with him, mainly because he's losing so much blood he can't drive. So she's going to drive. And, and then Doc actually has to borrow money from Dix to get a cab and uh, winds up getting in the cab, initially with the, the thought process that the cab is going to take him out of town, and then from there he'll hop on a train. But he actually hits it off with the cab driver and offers the cab driver a considerable amount of money to just take him to his destination. I forgot exactly where he wanted to go. I think it was a couple towns over or something like that, or next state yeah, over. I think they were in Cincinnati and they wanted to go to Cleveland. Like he he had to leave the area. Yeah. Um, so during this this transport, that the other the other really, really unsavory thing, Doc is played by Sam uh, Jeffy. I think I pronounced that right. J A F F E. Um, probably most notably for his roles in the day the earth stood still, obviously at asphalt jungle, uh, Ben, Hur. he, he's not, I, I feel like he was a very well-known actor in the 80s, 70s, 80s. Um, but nothing really, I think any of our listeners are going to be aware of this. This is, he just, this role in this film does earn him an, an Oscar nomination. Um, I don't know if he actually won or not. Let me look it up. Yeah, so he he wins an Oscar nomination um, and actually wins Best Actor um, the Venice Film Festival for Asphalt Jungle. He's a he's a very good actor in the in the movie. The issue I have with his character is that several times throughout the movie, the character mentions how he really can't wait to have all this money so that he can get himself a couple young women. <laughs> really into those young women. Um, and he makes that known at least three different times that he, he really likes young women. I believe that his name was his last name was Epstein. So <laughs> you can see there. Ooh, there's a connection possibly. Let's see how that how that lands in the future. <laughs> um, That's, if, if your listeners aren't laughing at that joke, <laughs> get new listeners. That's what I say. So uh, so he's he convinces the cab driver to take him to where he needs to go. They stop along the way for uh, a quick bite to eat. And while they're at this diner, there's a young, um, <laughs> there's a there's a couple of young folk. There's two young gentlemen and a young woman. And the young woman makes it very clear that she wants to dance. Uh, and the two guys are like, you know, we're all we're all danced out. So he gets a handful of nickels and walks over and puts them on the table and says, you know, dance your heart away. And then proceeds to just sit there and watch her as she dances, like he's in some sort of strip club 
and he's in a <laughs> diner. Um, and that will ultimately be his downfall yep. because while he's doing this, two police officers are watching through the window. They kind of get the glimpse of him. Now, mind you, his his face is already out there because uh, he's well known as a as a criminal. And this big heist just happened, so this lands him an arrest, and uh, you know he's ultimately caught. So now we just have Kentucky left, who is bleeding profusely. No, no, no. we have two left. You're forgetting that we still have Alonzo Emmerich, the the financier. Oh, that's well. right. That's right. That's right. And that's, that's, right. A, that's a big. This is a big thing that happens to him. So go ahead. It's true. So. Um, well, let's let's do Alonzo first because Kentucky's the last. Kentucky's the, the the final scene. So Alonzo, um, the the police come to him because the lawyer is missing, and they're known to be companions. Now Alonzo has dumped the lawyer's body because he's essentially been let off by Doc in Kentucky. As long as he dumps the body, and well, there's another caveat. Yeah, see, he tells. Uh, Marilyn Monroe's character that, hey, tell the police that I was with you between midnight and three. And uh, like 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 the ride or die chick she is, she says that the first go around, but under some ad- some additional grilling, she folds, right? So she can't hold up that lie. And the police now know that uh, he doesn't have an alibi for the missing lawyer's uh, whereabouts. And now they're putting the screws to the to him, right? Right, so they're going to arrest him. Um, he can't. He can't be arrested. He, there's no way he's going to do time because prison's a hard place. So he begins to write this letter to his wife, apologizing, basically saying, "I'm really sorry for everything I've done. Uh, you know, I, I'm a horrible person." And then about halfway through, says, "You know what? Forget it." Rips it up, throws it on the fire, and then shoots himself. Yes. So uh, let, let's let's pause here for me because there are a few things I want to discuss. Defet Comics is the publishing branch of Don'tForgetATowel.com, the only place to travel geekly. Focusing on creator-owned and independent titles like Hollowed, Pursuit of Plastic, and Fairy, and many more. Defat Comics will be a mix of genres appealing to every kind of reader. Join the new source of comic book entertainment with Defat Comics. The first is... I love how in the 1950s, if you're a rich, wealthy guy and the police are about to arrest you, he says, hey, I just want to go talk to my wife first. I'm going to go call my wife. They let him leave and go to the other room unsupervised. <laughs> unsupervised. <laughs> That's my first – like I giggle about that, right? But the second part is is the suicide. I think it's done really well, right? He rips up that, that letter, that beautiful love letter he kind of writes to his wife. He rips it off and then off camera kind of shoots himself. But this was a huge deal. This is 1950. This is yeah. post World War II. We're against communism. There's censorship going on. This was a huge deal to actually get in the film at all. So for them to be able to do this in a nice, classic, elegant kind of way without making it too uh, grotesque, if you will, for the time period, I think speaks to the to the movie. Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, that's part of the reason why I love watching these old movies is not only uh, there is there is no gratuitous violence. There, there is no blood, really. I mean, occasionally in some of these old movies, you'll get a fist fight where somebody will get like a bloody lip or something like that. But there's no, there's no gore. Um, most of the deaths happen off camera and are like, like in this movie, a guy takes one gunshot to the belly and it's like, all right, he's dead. Like that's it. He's, he's got, <laughs> got shot. Nowadays, the, the movies, somebody's arm gets ripped off and they're like, oh no, just quarterize it and it'll be fine. I'll move on to the next scene. It's, it's really kind of interesting to watch how some of these things have changed. Um, one of the other things I like that I think a lot of people find difficult, which is why a lot of these old films aren't appreciated as much as they used to be. It's easy to watch a movie now and it's easy to go back and watch these movies and say, they're, they're not original. I've seen this before. They're boring. But you have to put yourself into those time periods and realize that these movies were, were showing you something that had never happened before. A lot of these movies, these storylines of a simple you know heist or a simple you know detective mystery, in the, in the case of Maltese Falcon, um, 
it's it's the first time this has ever happened. I mean, the reason why Casablanca is on every list of greatest movies isn't because it's something you haven't seen. It's something be- that, that, that this is the first time you saw it. This is the first time you saw this sort of espionage love story, or in this case, this sort of bank heist. I mean, this is Heat 40 years before Heat comes out. That's a great point. That's a Heat's a great analogy for this movie because in a lot of ways it's character driven, right? And that's what I gripe about sometimes. When you look at movies like Ocean's Eleven, right, or The Italian Job, it's about the heist. How cool can we make this heist? Can, how can we, you know, have lasers and, you know, this crazy and insane story of it? That's not what this is about. If you're looking for tips on how to rob a jewelry store, you're not getting it from this movie. Which <laughs> you're not, right? What you're going to get, though, is, like, characters. You're going to get this development of, you know, what's going to happen next? Are they going to win? Are they going to lose? Are they going to be successful? You know, and you and you begin to care for them, I think, in ways that you might not in the movies that we see today. Because it's so action-packed, you know. It, we're here about the characters, not about the action. Yeah, so, I mean, that brings us back to Kentucky, who is... He's driving in the car. He's bleeding profusely. He's got Dahl with him. He winds up kind of passing out at the wheel. Um, and Dahl is able to get him to the local doctor in the middle of the night, um, wakes the guy up. And the guy basically says, you've lost a lot of blood and you've got to stay here. At, at this point, Kentucky is out cold. Um, and the doctor kind of recognizes him goes in the other room and proceeds to call the police and tell them that, yeah, I got this guy here. He's got a gunshot wound. Uh, he's he's pretty incapacitated. And while this is happening, Kentucky comes to. Dahl explains, like, I, I had to bring you here. You, you know, you were unconscious. He gets back behind the wheel and drives off with her. Uh, the doctor is like, you know, there's no way he's going to get very far. We cut to the final scene, which is him on the farm. He gets out of the car. He takes a few steps into the middle of the field and then basically collapses and he's, and dies. Um, so it's, it's the classic, all these bad guys are dead because they did a bad thing. It, it's just, this is a great movie. This is a movie about a bunch of guys who pull off the heist. The heist is successful, but the aftermath is what destroys them. Yeah, you know, I think that they put a, too much time into how do we do it and not how do we get away with it, right? I mean, it's just, it, you know, it's like the dog that is chasing the, the car tire and he's got the car tire, but like now he doesn't know what to do with it. It's the same way for these morons. You know, you, you know they, they do the heist, they've got the diamonds, and then, you know, either their greed or their stupidity or whatever it is uh, limits their success in the long run. And they all could have gotten away with it, right? It all starts with, with Alonzo Emmerich trying to double cross them. And then from there... It's all downhill. Yeah, and there's, agreed. There's, there's also snitches. You know, we we didn't talk about it, but everyone is snitching on everybody in one way, right? Marilyn Monroe snitching on him. Cubby, um, you know the the uh, the the bookkeeper. He's he gets pressure from the lieutenant, right? So now he's snitching on everybody. It's yeah. There it's, there is a an, another underlying story here about a crooked cop who knows the bookkeeper, and he's kind of pressed uh, to solve the case and and. He roughs the bookkeeper up, and the bookkeeper ends up snitching on a few people, and that's how um, the driver gets caught because he ends up getting arrested as well. Um, yeah, interesting movie. I mean, I think if you're a fan of this this type of old uh, noir type movie, check it out. It wasn't a movie I was aware of until we found it in the book, and I'm glad I saw it. Yeah, absolutely. This movie for me, it the plot is good, the acting is good. You're not going to get the action, but I watched it with a smile on my face, but I had a little bit of a, a smirk because there are just so many 1950s-esque things that you don't get in today's film. Absolutely. Right? You know, so if you kind of enjoy that thing uh, that's not really quantifiable, it's it's just a good, good, fun movie. Um, and I absolutely would recommend it to other people. So uh, if you remember right, in season one, we had the five questions that we ask everybody when it pertains to the movies. Well, based on our new purpose of was this a good movie, we trimmed that down to three questions that will hopefully help us answer that.
Uh, question number one, what is the message of the film and do you agree with it? Ooh, I think that the message, um, I think the message of the film is that we as human beings are all flawed. I think that every one of these characters, uh, which in some ways they're good in, good intentioned, in other ways they're not, but each one of them has something about them that is a flaw in their character, right? So, you know, for, uh, you can look at, you know, uh, Alonzo Emmerich, uh, he's the financier. He, his character flaw is that he's sleeping with uh, Marilyn Monroe. He's trying to double cross these other people. The lawyer who dies, all he cares about is money. Um, you know, Dix Handlin, uh, the, the, the cornbread mule, he's a gambler, right? I mean, he has to keep coming back to the bookmaker cause he's gambling so much. That's why he's committing crimes. Cause he, he, he's betting money on the ponies. Uh, so, you know, each one of them, and we could go down the list, they, they're all flawed in some way. And I think that is ultimately what does them in a lot of ways. Nice. Um, I, I saw the message more as, uh, you know, the, the bad guy being the bad guy doesn't pay. Um, I, I think that they really drove home the point that each person involved in the crime kind of got their their comeuppance, if you will, while either either arrested or, or dead. And that uh, that was the ultimate message was, you know, being bad isn't good, um, which is usually the message for a lot of these films, uh, you know, in the old olden times. Yeah, no. So along those lines, that's one of the things I always like about movies. I like a movie that makes you like the bad guy. Right. When, when I'm rooting for the bad guy, because they might be there's there is some good in there, but you're right. They're doing bad things. And I, I think that's what this is all about. Yeah. I mean, that's that's an interesting point. There's I think there's two main ways that filmmakers pull off the root for the bad guy. You either make the good guy so bad that the bad guy doesn't seem as bad anymore. Or in the case of this film, you make the bad guy so relatable that it's like, yeah, he's doing bad things, but I've done bad things and I consider myself a good guy. Um, and I think that's that's what this movie does is, you know, uh, Dix is is a bad guy. He gambles. He's probably gotten into several fights. He's, you know, obviously robbed some people or some places. But at the end of the day, you're kind of hoping he gets away because he's just trying to go back home to his farm and, and live out the rest of his life. So, yeah, I agree with that. Question number two, how did the movie leave you feeling? And do you think this was intentional? Um, you know, as this movie progresses, it, you see each one of the bad guys die, right? They are, you know, they're getting chopped down, you know, one scene after another. Um, and for me, I was rooting, as we kind of talked about here, for one of them to live, one of them to get away, one of them to be happy. And you don't get that. And for me, that I lo I liked that because I was kind of expecting someone to live. I was kind of expecting something good to happen, and it doesn't. And so for me, that um, was an interesting feeling because it kind of surprised me. So I'm going to say that this movie uh, kept me surprised. Yeah, I mean, this is this is prior to the test screening days of Hollywood now, where you you hear a lot about alternate endings or how they had to have reshoots because they'll put a film in front of a test audience and they'll get feedback and then they'll make changes based on what the audience wants to see. You don't get that in some of these earlier films. So this is, this is the story they intended on telling. Um, like you said, you, you kind of hope to see or want to see somebody survive in the end, but at the end of the day, you don't know what you want. And this is this story the conclusion that they have here, I think, sits right in the film. And I think allowing somebody to get away with it and and get out of it scot-free wouldn't have the same effect. And the, the, and sometimes that can be a negative, is having these test audiences that come in and say, oh, no, I really want to see, like, this character was really annoying, and then they reduce the screen time. Or, you know, I really like this character, so they reshoot the death so that he can come back in the sequel or something like that. And it, sometimes, sometimes the audience doesn't know what they want. Yeah, I agree 100%. I don't think this movie goes any other way. The, the way that it's filmed and shot, the director got what they wanted, right? You know, the, the story is told, and that's that. And uh, I think it's beautiful and, and good. Nice. Uh, okay, so last question. This is a callback to season one. What is the most important sequence in the movie? Ooh, the most important sequence in the movie. These questions are always tough, by the way. 
Uh, in fact, I actually was trying to prepare for these by doing the. I was because you know I'm, hey, I'm I'm seasoned now. I was trying to think about who would I get to play somebody else, and and you're not even going to ask that damn question. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, the most important sequence I think in the film for me, um, is when Doc is going to Cubby and he's. Um, Dix is, Dix is there, right? He kind of comes in and wants to make a bet on the ponies or whatever it is. And Cubby doesn't want to hear it because he's dealing with Doc and this big, this big uh, adventure he's about to go on. But Doc likes Dix. He likes his cornbread mule and, and he asks for him to come back, right? So mm -hmm. there's no, there's nobody else that can fill that role. So if Doc would have just kept his mouth shut, you know, he wouldn't have been there. Uh, for any of this this carnage that happened. So to me, that's a really important scene as they're kind of forming the team. Doc really wants a dicks. And uh, and in the end, those guys are thick as thieves together and, and good friends that ultimately go their separate ways, but they have a similar fate. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I agree with that. I think it's, it's an interesting, it's a very subtle scene that I agree with you could totally change the outcome of the movie if you, if you change that or get rid of it. Um, I have I have almost two answers to this question. I think the most important scene is the explosion of the safe. Um, if that bank alarm doesn't go off, they get away with this heist scot free, and everybody lives happily ever after. Um, but the first scene that came to mind when I read this question was the scene with um, the lawyer and um, Alonzo when they meet Doc in Kentucky, uh, Dix, because. That, you know, that gunfire exchange, the lawyer dying, and that's ultimately Alonzo's downfall. Um, and that screws up Doc and, and Dix's plan, who, which up to that point may have worked if Alonzo was willing to play along. Um, so I think that's a pretty important scene as well. Yeah, I agree. Even before that, when they, when Alonzo brings in the lawyer and kind of says, hey, this is, we should do this together. Will you be kind of my sidekick? And uh, he says, yes, I mean, that really set the tone for the rest of the movie. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, again, I mean, ultimately, the movie is a failure because it, it doesn't make near nowhere near its budget. Um, MGM uh, does keep the movie going. It's been released on DVD a few times and ultimately winds up being one of the more highly respected uh, earlier films of its generation. So with that being said, we've gone through a couple questions. We've gone through the recap of the film. I mean, that brings us back to our question. Was this a good film? It really depends on what you want in a film, right? So, you know, no one can ever ask me what my favorite movie is. You got to get more specific. You got to say, what's your favorite 80s action movie? What's your all-time favorite drama? Just because it's so wide, right? So for me, yeah, I like this movie a lot because I like these movies. If your fans like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles by Michael Bay or... You know, they're in love with Star Wars. This might not be the film for them. But if people are open minded and they really want to see a drama and they want to see acting and they kind of want to learn a little bit more about older movies and, and how they were done. Yeah, this is a great movie to get your feet wet. You know, it's it's right up there in the same era of, of Casablanca, uh, of of um, of any Alfred Hitchcock movie. Right. It's that is that era of of filmmaking. So, yeah, it's a good movie. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. Uh, one of the things we didn't we didn't talk about is Dix Hanley, uh, Kentucky, is played by Sterling Hayden, uh, who's most notably the cop who takes a bullet to the forehead in Godfather. That yeah, so he's the crooked police chief that sets up or lieutenant that sets up the meeting between Al Pacino's character uh, in the first Godfather, and then the opposing you know, rivalry, uh, gangster. Yeah. So, and that, so when your listeners are like, Oh, I don't know if I want to watch this movie. Like think about the cast and what they've been in, right? You've got Marilyn Monroe in, in one of her first roles, right? You, you've got, uh, Dix, who was obviously in the Godfather later. You have Brooks, uh, you know, Hanlon, you've got all these great actors, James Whitmore. Yep. Absolutely. It, it's um, going to be a good movie. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree. I think, I think, if you want to look at some Hollywood history and you can appreciate the movies for what they were in their context and in their time, this is a do not miss. You, you have to watch this movie. If you're looking for entertainment, if you want to sit down and watch a movie for entertainment purposes, this might not be the movie I'd pick. 
Um, again, based in today's context, it's not it's not comparing to the high CGI humongo budgets that exist now. No, uh, my wife my wife isn't watching this movie, right? right. I mean, like, that's, that's what, like that's like my wife's not watching it. But I will, and I did. I sat alone in a dark room and watched this movie by myself because uh, I knew it was going to be good. Uh, so one critic said that this is the greatest noir thriller of all time. Which, I mean, I'm a noir fan. That's that's stretching it a little bit. Um, I agree. <laughs> so w- one of the things I really do love to play is uh, guess that tomato. So let's head into that. Guess that tomato. Guess that tomato. Guess that tomato. So, uh, Asphalt Jungle does appear on Rotten Tomatoes. It has a critic score and an audience score. The uh, of the audience, it was seven thousand one hundred and eleven audience members rated this movie. Alec, what do you think they rated it? Those seven thousand one hundred people had to have seen this movie with intent. They had to have known this is a classic film, which Ooh, instantly interesting jaded, approach instantly jades them. So their numbers are going to be bumped up. I'm going high. I'm going 84. 84. Okay. As we do here, I'm going to give you the critic score. Uh, 35 critics rated it a total of 97, which is incredible. I'm also going to give you three movies that are graded pretty close to Asphalt Jungle, plus or minus 2%. And those movies are Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the Quentin Tarantino's 2019 movie starring Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio. Movie number two is Rocket Man. 2019's Elton John biopic and 1917 Sam Mendez's World War One drama. Oh, Bobby, 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 you know how to play my heart, friend. <laughs> you and I, you and I uh, had the, the honor of getting together a week ago, I guess now, and we watched this movie together, didn't we? 1917, and probably you- one of the best shot movies I have ever seen. Absolutely, absolutely. And so now... I said 84. I got the critic score at 96. I got to go higher. I mean, I, I got to go. I got to go 91 right now. 91. That's your final answer. That's my final answer. The audience score for Asphalt Jungle is. Eighty-seven. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm happy with I'm happy with it. It was right in the middle of your two guesses. Yeah. I, I will say that, that I think to date that is the highest audience score of any movie we've talked about in this podcast. Really? I'm actually, I'm more upset that 1917 is so damn low. <laughs> those numbers up, guys. Come on. Yeah, 1917 is a great movie. That's definitely, I mean, that we'll save that one for season three, I think. Absolutely. Um, so before I let you go, uh, it is a firm belief of the owners, don't forget a towel, that everybody geeks out on something. While it may not be 1950s movies or comic books, it might be, you know, robbing banks and, uh, you know, young women. So, Alec, what is it that you are geeking out on right now? Oh, right now, it's uh, Sunday night. So, you know I'm geeking out on fantasy football, my friend. And just by chance, whom am I playing this evening? The, oh, it's- unde- the undefeated two-time champion myself, yes. Yep, uh, the about-to-be-defeated, you, <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, fantasy football, you and I obviously play it together with a, a whole group of other uh, schlubs that we know and love. Um, who probably aren't downloading your podcast enough, those other actors. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm geeking out on fantasy football, although I'm having a shitty season. No matter what, I'm beating you tonight, baby. So I'm loving it's it. All that it's all that matters. It's all that matters. Well, thanks for joining me again. This is your your third time on the podcast. So I did check the rule book. Unfortunately, uh, double episodes, so you and another guest, do not count. Uh, so this is your second time. Uh, we do have a five-timers club, uh, but uh, we'll see if you hit that. Well, as long as I keep being the most downloaded person on your podcast, you better keep calling me back. Absolutely. Anything uh, you want to plug before we take off? No, no. <laughs> Just I want to plug your podcast. Like people, people need to download it more. I listen to it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna plug you. I listen to Little Giants as I do all your podcasts. But Little Giants uh, just came out last week. It was it, number one. I love Little Giants. If people don't know me, I. I'm in love with a little giant best movie of all time. Uh, top five mid nineties uh, family rom-coms. Who, who's your character? 
Um, that's a great question. You know, you're the playmaker, aren't you? I can see you as the playmaker. I'm I'm the guy in bubble wrap. That's what you're saying. <laughs> no, 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 the one who does the uh, annexation, annexation of Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Um, no, I mean, of course, I want to be Devin Sawa, but you know, my body <laughs> type doesn't align to that. Uh, but no, but so you know, I'm listening to the podcast uh, last week. It just just a fun podcast. More folks need to listen to it. It's uh, it, it's an hour out of your time. I'm listening while I'm at work, and uh, or you can listen in the car. Like, wh- wh- wherever you go, you download it, you listen to it. But uh, it, it always makes me laugh, so I, I do like listening to them. Well, thanks for the kind words, man. I appreciate it, and it was a, it was a pleasure talking to you. All right, man. Love you. See you later. Take care. You've got Gutsy Media Podcast. Leave a message about any movies you've covered and maybe we'll add to the show. Thanks. They sent me the voicemail again. You've got Gutsy Media Podcast. Leave a message about any movies you've covered and maybe we'll add to the show. Thanks. What? No, no, it just beats. And I don't like it. You've got Gutsy Media Podcast. Leave a message about any movies you've covered and maybe we'll add to the show. Thanks. I don't think anyone's answering the goddamn phone and I don't like it, piece of shit. You've got Gutsy Media Podcast. Leave a message about any movies you've covered and maybe we'll add to the show. Thanks. I'm calling about Asphalt Jungle. I first saw the picture at the Alamo Draft House in 1951 for a nickel. Popcorn was still overpriced back then. That's a joke for free. But it does remind me of a simpler time when you can mean what you say and not have to worry about the goddamn socialist crying about every word coming out of your mouth. But here's the rub. Only the author of Little Caesar could tell such a dramatic story. Or the director of Treasure Sierra Madre could film it in such a powerful way. Our main star, Dick Hanley, he's a hooligan with a twisted dream. And our girl doll just wanted to share a part in that little shabby dream of hers. Adding Angela as the easy living green-eyed blonde. And Gus as the right guy in the wrong place. And it's 80 minutes of excitement. I loved it then, and I loved it now. It's a masterpiece among thrillers. And it goes toe-to-toe with any film. And if you don't like it, I'll punch you in the fucking face. Ouch.